episode 64, Beast in View, by Margaret Millar. And welcome to Point Blank, everyone. My name is Kurt. Joining me, as always, here's Justin. Hey, Kurt. Hey, people out there. How, how's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. It's a new year, and uh, we're back to uh, talk about a, a pretty classic book, Beast in View by Margaret Millar. We'll get into that in just a second, but uh, Justin, I think we we wanted to express some thanks right off the bat, right? Yeah, yeah. We I wanted to give a shout out to a couple folks, uh, some folks who have been uh, helping us out on Patreon, helping to keep us afloat. This is a, a non-money-making enterprise, so some long-time donators plus a couple new folks. Uh, we have Jeffrey. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Jeffrey, uh, Joshua, Lawrence, Christopher, who's brand new. We're going to tip our hats to you and and thank you for your support. We do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. It does mean a lot to us. And and uh, even though, you know, you know, we just do this for for the hobby, it does help that you all give us a little support. And basically what those those donors are doing right now is you're helping uh, support hosting of the show because we, we prefer to use Libsyn. It's just a better service, in my opinion, for hosting a podcast. To get that better service, uh, you pay a little bit of money, and uh, our donations right now do help cover those expenses. So we really appreciate that. We also, you know, we love getting good reviews on iTunes. It's, it makes our day. It makes doing this worth it. And we got another nice one here from Dodger Bill. Um, ha- has some nice things to say about, he says, a serious critical analysis of the books I love. And, I, and thank you for that, because that's what we're kind of trying to provide here. And uh, he also mentions, or I'm assuming it's a he, I guess. I shouldn't do that. They mentioned that it's a great way to add to my to-be-read list, and isn't that a fact? Uh, we're doing the podcast, and my to-be-read list in this category gets longer and longer with every episode. I imagine the same case is for you, Justin. Oh, absolutely, and that's one thing I love about this podcast is that I build my own uh, to-read list as you and I come up with ideas for future shows and start doing our homework, and it's amazing the kind of stuff we come across as we're digging for one author and find this weird genealogy uh, of authors that have all influenced and inspired each other and a lot of them I'm not familiar with until I've sat down and really dug in dug into the archives so this is a great opportunity for us and and I'm glad to hear that some of our our listeners are are also valuing uh, this sort of exploration that we undertake you know even today's episode is a good example of that I'm I'm reminded of of well, not just Margaret Millar's work that we're going to talk about here. I'm, I would like to check out some of her other novels, but I'm also reminded of how much I want to get back to her her husband, Kenneth Miller, uh, or Ross McDonald's work. I mean, I love the, the Lou Archer books, and I have unfortunately haven't had a chance to read one since we did the episode on his. I love his work, and I really want to get back to it, so... The one that I was really excited to uh, tackle was called The Galton Case, which happens at, it's the book that happens right after the one we reviewed way back That's when right. in 2018. And, and and this does inspire me to get back there. Not to say that Ross is better than Margaret, but they both come at crime fiction from, from different angles. Uh, and it's just incredible that they spent their lives together under the same roof, uh, generating this just magnificent canon of real classic crime fiction. Yeah, that's an interesting thing to think about, and I think we're going to get into that in our discussion. We're going to do a little compare and contrast and talk about that here in a few minutes. But yeah, just think of the the literary work of, of this genre that happened under under one roof. I just I like to envision these these ideas of the two of them running scenes and dialogue past each other. I, I don't know. I have to assume that happened, um, but uh, but wow, yeah, it's just really fascinating to think about that. So. I mean, I guess we should just dive right into it here, Justin. You say, let's just get going? Yeah, I don't see why not. I think maybe starting with a little bit of a bio would uh, be a good place. Sure. I've got a, a, a basic bio here. I mean, I think if you really want a full spectrum of information here, I think I would suggest going back and, and listening to that episode on Ross McDonald because we do discuss that. And also the, the biography on Ross McDonald. I think it's called like Ross McDonald. Was it written by Tom Nolan? Yes, it's the Tom Nolan book on Ross McDonald. It it does cover Margaret substantially in that book. And, you know, not that she doesn't deserve her own biography, but if you're looking for context, that's a great place to go. But let's just start with the bare bones here and, and go from there. Margaret Ellis Millar, and it is Millar. This is such an interesting thing, too, here, is that uh, 
They disagreed on how to pronounce their own last name. <laughs> Margaret pronounced it Millar. Um, Kenneth Miller, a.k.a. Ross McDonald, pronounced it Miller. So I guess, you know, just be uh, mindful of who you're talking about here. But she was born in 1915. She died in 1994. She was an American-Canadian mystery and suspense writer. She would write uh, 27 books in her career. Um, she would win numerous awards, but she would become a grandmaster of mystery fiction in 1983 from the Mystery Writers of America. And in 1956, she won the Edgar Allan Poe Best Novel Award for the book we're going to talk about today, Beast and View. And she's been, you know, her name and her books often come up in a hundred best uh, lists uh, from the 20th century in, mis in mystery fiction, but also American fiction as well. She, as a, a student, she attended the University of Toronto, where she would uh, meet around that time Kenneth Miller. They'd get married in Canada and move to Santa Barbara, which would become um, a fixture of both of their work and a key part of their life. Um, she wrote under didn't usually write under a pseudonym, but did do that a couple of times under the pseudonym of San Felice and Santa Felicia. Tragically, uh, we discuss in, this in greater detail in the Ross McDonald episode, but they had a daughter, Linda, who would die uh, in 1970 in a, a car accident. Is that right, Justin? No, I, I think there were. No? I think there was a car accident that was a critical moment in her development uh, as a teenager. She got drunk okay. and, and actually killed a child. And, and later on that's in life, right. uh, I, I think it might have been suicide. Yeah, that's a, and, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's tragic, but it's also interesting on in like how many of these, these social issues and things that come up uh, in, in Millar's work. You know, that's one thing that really stands out to me in this book and also in her, her, her library of work is this, uh, she looked at a lot of issues of class and security, um, you know, the, the sass and ultimately failure of the American dream, ideas of loneliness and sort of isolation and, and a lot of mental health issues as well. Mm -hmm. You know, she's known for this psychological type of crime fiction writing and a lot of surprise endings, but she was a pioneer author um, of writing about the psychology of women. And that is that definitely comes through in this work. And I think as, as a female writer of the 20th century, she is, is one of the key literary figures. And, um, you know, she did touch a lot on, on issues. And again, we're going to see this in this, this book today that are, I would say, ahead of their time in a lot of ways. Although this is not necessarily that well credited, she might have been a screenwriter, um, but she's mostly known for her, her literary work. She was also an avid bird watcher. Uh, she wrote one book about bird watching. Two of her works, both Beast in View and Roses Last Summer, uh, were made into TV anthologies. They were, she did not have a lot of stuff that was converted into a film, in part uh, that may have had some problems with you know, the Hollywood code at the time because of the themes that she often explored. I'll end my brief uh, covering here with this. In 1987, critic and mystery writer H.R.F. Keating said this uh, about Millar and Beast in View. Margaret Millar is surely one of the late 20th century crime writers' best writers in the sense that the actual writing in her books, the prose, is of superb quality. On almost every page of this one, there is some description, whether of a physical thing or a mental state, that sends a sharp ray of extra meaning into the reader's mind. So we'll, we'll explore the book in greater detail in a few minutes, but first I think we wanted to take a few minutes and kind of talk about the writing of Millar and compare that a bit with uh, the work of Ross McDonald. Is that right, Justin? Yeah, let's do that. Well, first off, as, as you already alluded to, uh, Margaret Millar and, and Ross McDonald or, or Kenneth uh, Miller uh, came together uh, as young people in Canada when they were uh, high school into college. Uh, they had a mutual attraction, but they also had a mutual like healthy competition. It was in Kenneth, Millar, Kenneth Miller's Miller, who in 1931 was the editor for a uh, college journal called The Grumbler, and it was him who accepted Margaret Millar, who went by Margaret Sturm, Sturm at the time. Uh, it was her first story that was published. So their coming together was manifested through like this transaction of editor and writer, and they carried that back and forth throughout the throughout their life. Something I find. Uh, quite interesting. She was a she was a regular editor of his work, and to some extent, vice versa. What did you want to say, Kurt? 
Oh, I was just, your discussion there reminded me of a point I wanted to make during her biography and, and this back and forth dynamic that you're talking about is, is part of that in that at various stages of their careers, one or the other was more popular. And at the time that a lot of these books, both hers and Ross McDonald's came out, she was really the better known author. And I think that's an important distinction to make as we, you know, as, as modern readers, we probably are more exposed to Ross McDonald. But Millar was, was a big name in her time. And that is part of the reason why Kenneth Miller chose to write under the pseudonym of Ross McDonald was to not you know, conflict with, with her name in the publishing world. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a good point to make. When when I came to crime fiction to try to understand it, it was Ross MacDonald, who was like the great heir to Chandler and Hammett, uh, who I heard about, who I came to understand, and who I wanted to actively pursue. It was only through like secondary research that I realized that he was also married to an author, somebody that was not on my radar, and somebody that I was not reading about in the sources that I was seeking. Uh, that could be part me, it could be part the sources, but the fact is, uh, in the 40s and 50s, Margaret Millar was, was a big thing. She was selling a lot of copies. She was making good money. She was sort of holding down the fort for this family before Ross McDonald really, you know, exploded with his Archer novels and short stories. I, I really feel like it was her that got, got things rolling in terms of making her literary work a sustainable source of money for the family. And then it was then it was Ross. But the entire time they had this uh, interaction in terms of how they shared their work and how they went about getting their work published. I just find it intriguing that, that this didn't lead them to ruin because um, I find it incredibly difficult to hang out with writers. Uh, we're all so <laughs> freaking annoying. Uh, so, and the fact is that their relationship was actually quite strained at times, uh, but they were able to put their literary careers in, in a certain way first and sort of separate it from the high drama that was their partnership, uh, especially as it relates to Linda and the kind of uh, path that Linda took, some of which was tied to Linda's frustrations and, and angers and mental health issues, was tied to the fact that she she resented her family for writing about stuff that involved Linda, for writing about Linda's life, for writing about psychological experiences that Linda was introducing them to. I think that that was a weird kind of line that we all have to walk about how we include our the people that are closest to us in our in our own creative work and where you draw that line and where you say no and where you protect your uh, close ones and something about that did not sit well with Linda as far as I've read and I, I think uh, you'll see that in a lot of as you said Kurt a lot of the psychological fiction that Millar writes yeah for sure because I mean I mean, this, I'm not, I can't remember exactly what year Linda was born. I believe this novel was probably written either before she was born or when she was a baby or something. Yeah, so uh, it um, was. I think she was born in like, let's see, 74, like 39 or so. Okay, so, you know, young. But yeah, I mean, it, it is an interesting point when you have parents who are writing about deep psychological issues and, and constantly and using that as a, a a plot device and if you feel that you're under the microscope as a as a, a effectively a experimental subject of their writing that could be a v very potentially damaging experience i agree and i think i'm going to go back to this competition they had um it was it was kenneth who got margaret published first Kenneth was actually published in the same journal, amusingly enough. He published his own writing as editor. I would say that that's usually not the best way to go about things, whatever. He was the first to get paid to publish a story, but Margaret was actually the first to sell a novel in 1941, and then Ross sold a novel in 1944, and at that point, they were both, uh, you know, good to go. But they had weird, very different ideas about how to raise children. Uh, Ross, he wanted to have a more empathetic empathetic uh, approach to raising a child, whereas yeah, right. Margaret was influenced by a certain popular psychologist at the time that believed in withholding emotional love was the best way to uh, help a child. I don't know a lot about that, and I don't want to explore it deeply, but I think that chasm uh, in their approaches uh, quite possibly led to some of the complications in Linda's life. Sure. That coldness, like knowing about that, I would call it, yeah, coldness, coldness in parenting. It's interesting to think about that in, in a reading of Beast in View, because this is ultimately a, 
I mean, it isn't ultimately, I guess, but it is a story of children and parents as much as it's a story about anything else. And there's, you know, some some very potentially deep conversations within this novel uh, in that parent and, and child dynamic that you have to wonder uh, about how Margaret would have approached that in her own life. Yeah, that's a good point. And we'll probably transition really soon here to to a, a synopsis of Beast in View. But but the domestic, the familial domestic relationships in this book are deeply unsettling. I mean, especially in the case of, of Helen Clarveau's family, the, she's the protagonist and and her mother and her brother. Uh, there, there's some weird stuff going on there, uh, seemingly withholding a lot of delusion. And, and yeah, it raises some questions about where if that was something that Margaret was pulling from her own experiences or, or if this was an entirely new situation for her. But what do you think? Do you want to do you want me to dive into uh, our review of the book? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it might be best to if we can come back to some of M- Millar and, and uh, her writing technique or whatever in the, in the in the novel that would be great but yeah let's let's give us a summary of beast in view all right so i'll dive in deep here i'll I'll give everybody uh, a fairly nuanced review there will be spoilers at the end because this is a book that sort of thrives on its giant spoiler so I'll give you a heads up. I'll send you a, an alarm when, when I'm about to go into spoiler country so that folks who, for some reason, have not yet read the book but are listening to the podcast, you can turn down the volume or step away uh, so as not to uh, ruin the magic uh, of this novel. That being said, let's dive in here. As Kurt noted, Margaret Millar's Beast in View was published in 1955. Uh, And it also won the Edgar Award for Best Novel uh, one year later. Uh, This was a tremendous novel. It's considered by many to be her strongest novel. Uh, It was turned into two Alfred Hitchcock television shorts or specials, I guess, like one hour long television shows. Um, I haven't seen them. Uh, I wish it would have been turned into a film. But but as Kurt said, it might have been uh, related to the Hayes Code. In short, in one sentence, this novel is about the fracturing mind of a woman on the edge of madness. In chapter one, we are introduced to our protagonist. Uh, Her name is Helen Clarvo, and she's a wealthy 30-year-old quote-unquote spinster. It's funny that there's already spinsters at the age of 30 in this era, but whatever. Miss Clarvo receives a phone call from an old acquaintance. This is how the story starts. Uh, This acquaintance is named Evelyn Merrick. And Merrick is scaring Clairvaux. It's sort of like a a crank call. And she predicts a violent future for Helen. And after the call, Helen is very shook up. Moments later, uh, the prediction Merrick makes actually comes to pass as Helen slips and scrapes her face on the edge of a desk. And and this scares her deeply. And she reaches out for help. She contacts Paul Blackshear, who's a family lawyer. And he comes over and talks to her. And after some hemming and hawing, he agrees to take on a case as an amateur detective. Is he a detective? Absolutely not. But he is interested in it. You know, he he has a a boyish interest in in playing this role. And while he's not sure he trusts Helen entirely, he does feel that it's not going to be a major case. It's not something he can't do. He just has to find this woman. Who and where is Evelyn Merrick? Because Evelyn Merrick is mentioned to uh, Helen that she would be famous for her body, Mr. Blackshear presumes that she's a model, and this leads him to the Lydia Hudson School of Charm and Modeling. And it's here he learns from the owner, Sarah, that Evelyn uh, did in fact attend a school. So here we go. He's on, he's on the case and he's making progress. Uh, this leads him to a studio, an art studio that's owned by this guy named Harley Moore. And Miss Merrick uh, did actually go there. She was hungry for work and she needed to do some modeling to, to pay some bills. And it turns out that she worked with Jack Tarola, who's a local photographer who works in the studio. So Blackshear visits with Tarola and learns that Merrick did work there uh, for a couple hours, but he sent her packing because she got nosy. Because apparently he's doing some stuff behind the scene. There's pinup girl stuff happening, maybe some some light pornography uh, happening in the back room. So she's gone, but now we know at least that he's on the trail. Meanwhile, we switch gears and we uh, we see Bertha Moore. She's the wife of Harley, the studio owner. She gets a call from Evelyn Merrick, and Merrick wants to visit Bertha's new baby that she heard all about from Harley. So. 
Bertha actually reaches out. She gets a Harley gets a hold of her and learns that of this planned visit by Evelyn. And he says, "Don't let her into the house." Like like a warning. Don't let her in. Like she's sketchy as fuck. Essentially, is what he's getting at. Uh, but it's too late. Evelyn's already there. She visits the baby. And then she drops a bombshell on Bertha. She says that her husband has been cheating on her with his art models and leaves Bertha, you know, into this total state of of panic and concern. So we're starting to see how Evelyn operates. She plants these seeds of terror in the minds of people. Why? You know, what's her function? Why is she doing this to people? Laura Lippman refers to Evelyn, the character, the antagonist in this novel, as the beast in the title, the beast in view. This is a woman with an uncanny knowledge of others' weaknesses who preys on the fears and anxieties in the hopes of invading their lives. That's a fair explanation of what she's doing, but the question remains, why? This behavior continues as we learn more about Merrick and the ways in which she manipulates and deceives people, either by visiting them and planting lies or by calling them on telephones from random bars and and sowing seeds of distrust and confusion. We get some backstory about Evelyn and Helen, too. They, Helen actually knows Evelyn, and they were childhood friends, it turns out. Evelyn was this fun, free-spirited gal who would go to the dances and dance with the boys, while Helen was the awkward, shy one who would hide in the bathroom rather than engaging with the world around her. So this planted the seeds of, of why Helen might have feelings about Evelyn, but... We wonder, why would Evelyn want to hurt Helen? What did Helen ever do to her? Back to Blackshear. He's still on the path. He meets with Helen's mother, Verna, and learns the connection between Evelyn and Douglas Clairvaux. Douglas Clairvaux is Helen's brother, and Evelyn and Douglas were actually married for a brief time. And now we start to see things come together. Uh, Why did their marriage not last? It turns out that In all likelihood, there's a strong implication that Douglas is a closeted gay man. This backstory deepens Blackshear's understanding of Evelyn's role in the lives of this family and explains why Evelyn might be stalking Helen. So now we're starting to close in on on the so-called truth. Later on, Evelyn calls Verna and tells her that Douglas has been spending time in the rear room, in the back room at Torella's studio, presumably engaging in pornographic acts or whatever. This prompts Verna into action. She confronts her son about the secret, and this leads to his death. He contemplates suicide and then talks himself out of it, but then falls and ends up breaking his own neck and dying. So we have our first death, and it's not going to be the last Meanwhile, we get a little bit about Evelyn's psychology, and wow, she's nuts. We get this moment when she's uh, walking out of a bar and talking about how she's essentially invincible. Here's a quote. People huddling in doorways and under awnings looked at her curiously. She knew they were thinking how unusual it was to see a gay, pretty girl running alone in the rain. They didn't realize that the rain couldn't touch her. She was waterproof. And only a few of the smart ones guessed the real reason why she never got tired or out of breath. Her body ran on a new fuel, rays from the night air. So she's gone. She's in another realm of existence. Uh, she sees the world through eyes that are so removed from, from the rest of the characters that, that we, we see her clearly as batty and dangerous. As I said, the bodies start to pile up. First Helen's brother. Then Mr. Blackshear revisits Mr. Tarola the art guy, and finds a pair of scissors in his lifeless torso. So who the hell did this? Uh, We start to wonder. This is the two-thirds mark of the story. We come into Act 3 with a clear understanding that Evelyn Merrick is a murderer, and we fear that Helen Clairvo will be next. And then it happens. Evelyn kidnaps Helen, drugs her, and drops her off at a bordello. When Mr. Blackshear finally tracks down Evelyn, she's out near UCLA, he finds a perfectly sane and reasonable woman. Evelyn Merrick does not seem wild and dangerous. She's asking him questions like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't understand where you're coming from here. He's perplexed by the depths of her deception. Well, we are too, frankly, as readers. But then something clicks for him. And this is where I pause because everything after this is a massive spoiler. So uh, if you want to avoid a spoiler, if you haven't read this, uh, I would suggest you step away from from the radio for a moment, turn down your iPod or whatever, step away. Five, four, three, two. Are you gone? Because here it comes. If you've already read the book, then you know what comes next. The spoiler is this. 
Helen Clarvo is Evelyn Merrick. Suffering from multiple personality syndrome, Helen has been manufacturing the threats, unaware entirely or supposedly entirely of her own actions, just as she's been unaware of her phone calls from the bar phones, her visits and murder of Mr. Tarola, and the fact that she is responsible in part for her own brother's death. Is there a real Evelyn Merrick? Yes, but she is the fun, free-spirited girl that Helen envied and despised as a youth, the friend who had it all. She married her brother, she lives her own life, she's a relatively healthy, sane person, and Helen can't stand that. The book ends uh, noirishly with the following conversation between Helen and herself, Helen and her alter ego. Here it is. She stared into the crystal ball of the mirror and saw her future, the nights poisoned by memories, the days corroded by desire. It's only a matter of time, Helen. You'll be well again. Be quiet, she said. You lie. She looked down at the knife in her hand, and it seemed to her that it alone could speak the truth, that it was her last, her final friend. She pressed the knife into the soft hollow of her throat. She felt no pain, only a little surprise at how pretty the blood looked, like bright and endless ribbons that would never again be tied. As Hinkson writes in his essay, Beast in View, Margaret Millar at 100, The revelations at the end of Beast in View add up to more than just a gimmick or a twist. They deepen the story and darken its ultimate meaning. Uh, I would call this a taut, pot-boiling page-turner. The twist is well wrought. It's since become a cliche, but at the time it wasn't. So you got to give Millar a lot of credit for nailing this twist. It's incredibly powerful. And after reading the book a second time, you realize how much it changes all of the characters in a lot of ways. This is a fascinating book, and I'm going to say it's worth five. Five stars, five hits from me. So, Kurt, uh, I'm curious to hear what you thought of the book, and then we can dive into some of the characters. Ooh, I'm still reeling from that ending, Justin. It is a great last couple of lines to a book. I'm torn on this one a little bit. I think there are sections, there are exchanges in this book that are a five out of five for me. There is some of it that falls flat for me, and and I would have to give that more of a three. So I guess I am ultimately giving this a four. Which is not to say that I did not care for Millar's writing. I think her writing is is a five. I felt that there was some some plotting elements that I I didn't care for as much. So that's that's why I'm giving it a, a four. So a little bit more divergent than our normal. Uh, you know, our ratings tend to be pretty close together. <laughs> a little different on this one. No, and that's totally fair. Uh, I wasn't sold on it at the beginning. Um, I do love a, a short book, so. I'm almost willing to give a five to any book under 200 pages. Uh, I, I jest, but, yeah. but I love books that are tautly written, that focus in on the issue and can resolve things within 200 pages. They're my favorite kinds of books. And yeah, there's something to be said about her writing. I mean, there are moments where this, this is a straight up hard boiled novel. There are moments when it feels more like a domestic novel. She's captured this interesting fusion with an economy of words and that incredible twist. I'm going to stick with my five, but I could see why somebody might give it a slightly lesser rating. But certainly, we have enough characters and we have enough things going on in this book to to talk a little bit more. Um, sure. There's the whole Clarvo family. We have Paul Blackshear, the, the lawyer detective. And then we have Evelyn Merrick and her mother. And then we have a, some side characters. Is there anybody, do you want to talk about Helen first or do you want to talk about somebody else? Who, who really stood out to you here? Well, um, boy, um, I mean... We probably should talk about Helen because, I mean, it is such a key part of the book. I mean, I think just just to step back for just a moment, um, you know, I think your your description and and some of your analysis is is almost forcing me to want to bump up my rating. Um, But I'm going to refrain from doing that. I think one thing I just want to say, and and maybe and this does touch on the characters, um, is that I just had a little usually I don't have as much I don't have a lot of trouble um, trying to put on my, my time machine hat and stepping back to the period in which this was written um, or our books have, were written and trying to think of it in that context, I had a little more trouble with this one. Um, and hmm. and I think, and that's that touches on the, the, the Helen character right off the bat. Like, I, you know, we start off with her as being a, a, a young woman who has lost her father she's moved out of the house but she has enough money to like support herself right yeah. and she's like a trust fund girl 
with extreme social awkwardness. Yeah, or and, and I think that's a, a reoccurring type character type that we find in this time period, and especially in this psychological thriller type of writing, where we have essentially a rich character who has is suffering this angst, and I just I just have a hard time with that character. Yeah, but and, and this touches on the other characters is I do think that where Millar excels here. Uh, compared to other authors who have used this same character type, is the diversity of other characters in which we get to interact with uh, in the novel. And I do think that she does a better job with that. So, yeah, Helen, um, you know, I I think it's interesting, the development of the character throughout the novel, how we go from what I just expressed as like this, like, uh, so what? It's a you know, a rich girl sitting alone in a hotel room who has some sort of angst. And then uh, Millar does do a good job of building on that character. And we go, oh, well, she is a little more complex than we, we first thought, uh, thought as we explore, especially this, and this becomes foreshadowing, but this story of her and Evelyn Merrick uh, in going to this high school dance where they have two very different experiences where Evelyn is kind of the life of the party and Helen spends the uh, the party crying in the bathroom. And then she she tells this elaborate lie to her father who picks her up from the dance and and means, you know, well, you know, for his daughter, I think. But she creates this elaborate lie and then she gets caught in that lie and her father kind of calls her out on that. Um, and it, it leads me to think ab- about the situation where we fi- find this novel. And I wonder, because her father called her out on the lie earlier, I wonder if her father uh, provided some some grounding in this, this situation yeah. or not. I mean, one kind of has to come to that conclusion a little bit, I think. Yeah, I, th- I think that's fair because the one character who talked some sense into her that held her accountable for her actions is no longer in the story. He's, he's dead. So she's left sort of un, untethered. And able to, or whatever, uh, free to fall into this realm of, of lying for lying's sake to the point that it really distorts who she is as a human being. But yeah, I think that is a, a critical moment in the story, that that dance story and her father calling her on her shit for being an, a, an elaborate fabricator of, of the truth. And us seeing Helen, perhaps at that moment, as not some hapless old maid who is at the mercy of the world but somebody who's who could be an entirely unreliable narrator but we're not sure yet i certainly felt that immediately i was like oh she sounds like she's she could be full of shit about all of this uh what's the truth yeah and i I like that you know as we get to the end of the novel because I, i think that speaks to millar giving us a very clear like indicator like you know sometimes with these twist endings you feel unsatisfied that you weren't given the right signals or sometimes maybe it was just too blunt what the signals are but i think millar's balance yeah. here with this character's development is is quite good i agree yeah she didn't over it isn't overly sold but you, you don't want nothing because then it's just a deus ex machina ending and we don't want that either so yeah you know i guess you know i wonder about this question do you feel that in the dialogue that that happens during the course of this story does Blackshear, does does his character kind of at times fall in that place of where her father may have fit uh, in her existence before? Like, kind of questioning her and, and or not. Did that lead there for you? or? I mean, I could see it. Uh, I don't think they, they had the, the kind of interaction that, that where he held her accountable, in part because he also expressed a an attraction to her yeah and that that sort of muddies the waters a little at the halfway point he's he's seen helen as this sort of hapless woman in need of 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 a man or love and and he has an attraction to her and he expresses it and she rejects it Uh, so he might be a little bit lovesick in all of this uh, and not and not until the end seeing her for who she is but he certainly is like a well, I don't think he's a, an impressive character or somebody that that I'm like drawn to. He was a foundational character. He kept us rooted. He was the one who was helping us to understand what the heck's happening. Yeah. Without him, there is nobody who fills that role. Yeah, he's definitely a stand-in for a narrator or for the reader to, to travel around this space. So, I mean, he his character is doesn't really have a ton of development, but it is, you know, it is interesting to see. It gives us somebody who 
in, has gets to interact with all these different people, but without giving away our twist ending because he isn't seeing the supposed um, Evelyn and Helen in the same space ever. Yeah, it's so odd. And, and when I think about who the protagonist is, I, I'm saying it's Helen, but the fact is that she's not really in the book very often and we don't spend much time with her. We're supposed to, I, I guess this is a fascinating thing about about Millar's creation. She's established Helen as a, as a protagonist, but then we don't really spend time with her because if we did, we'd, well, for one, it'd be boring, but we'd also reveal that she's nuts. Yeah. So she creates this Blackshear character to send us off on this fool's quest to go find out what's really happening out there so that there's actually a novel. We get to meet everybody and, and see what they say versus what they mean. In the meantime, Helen pops in every once in a while to, you know, feed us a little bit more of this or that. But it's it's an interesting structure. And then we have the antagonist, who is Evelyn, mm-hmm. who actually is Helen. So it, the perceived protagonist is actually the antagonist and Blackshear is a stand-in for the protagonist. It's an interesting structure. And, and somehow, I don't know how he, she managed to make that work. Yeah, that that is a good lesson. And I, I also think it's interesting. I didn't even think about this until just a second ago, but it's important that Blackshear is not an actual detective or a cop because a yeah. real detective were, would, would have a photo and say, Hey, have you seen this woman? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. 20 page story. Yeah. Um, so inter- interesting choice there. I guess, are there other, other characters that you want to talk about? You know, I mean, there's Harley and Bertha and Verna and Harrison and Annabelle. I don't really care about like all these characters are interesting. Uh, we could probably say something about Douglas and his yeah. closet homosexuality and his suicide and like uh, that. You know, she handles homosexuality like a lot of writers handle homosexuality at the time. There's a little bit of sympathy, but uh, there's also this you know recognition that that it, it's still an under it's underground behavior that is kept in the closet uh, and and having that exposed leads to incredible you know trouble i'd rather talk just briefly about how freaking awesome evelyn merrick is uh the bad one the one who is really helen the <laughs> yeah walking around making calls on bar phones threatening to ruin people's lives challenging bartenders getting their names in case if they say shit about her so she's gonna ruin their life like she was these are the words i wrote a vicious vindictive diabolical clinically insane beyond QAnon. she believes she's <laughs> waterproof ratted out Douglas's homosexuality to his mother, who is her mother. Yeah. She ratted out her own brother yeah. to her mom, leading to his suicide. And she's like, ha ha, whatever. Uh, and then she goes to the bars and, and I like, it's just to imagine Helen as this character makes Helen, um, ev- though evil, so much cooler. I just love how, how this character is captured. It's a really impressive and frightening you know, antagonist. One of the more uh, interesting antagonists I- I've read. Yeah, no, for sure. And it is, I mean, she's ruthless. It's just this cold ruthlessness. And it's interesting too, how, you know, the, 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 almost all of this is accomplished through, through suggestion, through reading people, through knowing what the strings are that need to be pulled. And and it's just a, a master of manipulation. And it's interesting to think about that in the sense of like, how long has that been, you know, going back to that story from high school, how long has that skill been, been her, her thing? How it kind of makes me wonder like why, you know, the, the time between high school and now, yeah. how did she get there? Because it's so ingrained. It's so uh, developed that you would think, I mean, maybe that's why there's this big divide between her mother and her brother and her, but how did she get there without anybody noticing this so far? Just a, a really a really good character and it would be you know this is one of those books that would be sort of almost impossible to film because you couldn't show it visually uh necessarily yeah i'm just envisioning these scenes with her and how maniacal that would feel it, it could earn some actor an oscar for for playing that dual performance of helen and evelyn but like you said it tricky to film i'll be curious to see how hitchcock uh, played that out in in his uh, short adaptions 
uh, which I haven't seen yet. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe you could do that through phone, you know, like a lot of these converse, early conversations could be done over a phone call or something instead of yeah. Blackshear actually being there. Um, I mean, I guess today you could almost take the, the fact that so many, like, Hollywood actresses look almost identical <laughs> as <laughs> as a way to do this. But yeah, no, just, just a, a really good character, one of those... Of you know book villains that will you know kind of stay with you for a long time. Yeah, absolutely, and and that brings me to to writer's craft. A couple of questions. Uh, for one, I thought this was pretty clear, unadorned prose. It gets right to the point. The dialogue is is strong. Would you call this book hard boiled at all, or or no? Um, I would hesitate to call it that. I mean, I think it has elements of that but i don't i know i don't think i would call this uh hard-boiled would you i i mentioned it but i guess i feel like i'm backpedaling a little bit on that and saying there are moments but overall uh not quite i do when i read this book when i think about margaret millar i i also think about dorothy b hughes and it brings to mind in a lonely place and i think about how dorothy b hughes was you know, was writing a noir that w- wasn't necessarily hard boiled, but also was economical in, in, in the word choice. And maybe that's really what it is. It's just economical rather than hard boiled. But I do think about how Dorothy B. Hughes uh, creates this uh, serial killer antagonist, but disguises him in in that novel in a way that's clever and keeps us unclear as to what's really happening until the end. And how that could be considered a sister work of of, of Beast in View uh, because they're doing similar things, sure. keeping us in suspense. There's the psychological element and there's the uncertainty, though this has a bigger twist. Both of them, I think, capture L.A. I think this is a sunnier book, whereas that one is, a. I always think about night when I think about In a Lonely Place. Man, both of those books and both of these these authors are, are incredible. And though I think Dorothy Hughes is, one of my favorite authors of all time. Margaret Millar is up there, and I definitely want to start thinking about them in the context of each other's work. Sure, that's a very good point. And I think, you know, I think, as we say with a lot of these ones that we enjoy, I would love to read another, some more of Millar's work and kind of get a better sense of um, of her. I, you know, I think one thing, and I, I, maybe we can move away from characters, um, but I just, I love so much of the witty and critical like sharp retort in this book there's so many like little good lines that the various characters cut into each other about throughout the work and i i I like that too and i feel like that's where it shares a little bit of a similarity with some hard-boiled fiction where you have these these dialogues that go back and forth and and they're not but they're not very they're not very long but they're 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 cut and and kind of little word daggers i guess I, I agree with that, and it actually reminds me of one uh, I posted on my Facebook page. It's one of the mothers says, like, hey, let's have a drink. What should we drink to? I think she's talking to Blackshear, and he's like, uh, I don't know. And she's like, okay, well, let's drink drink to nothing, to nothing. And then she downs yeah. her drink, and I was like, yes, <laughs> like that's awesome. Uh, she's going to drink for whatever. Little moments like that, the real sharp, uh, uh, you know, aware writing uh, that was, I agree, uh, deeply impressive and even ones that don't have a whole lot to do with 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 the plot but things that just like sharp observations that make me go okay i i know the sort of author i'm dealing with here like she has this line that towards the beginning it's all the best people had a sun porch which was indescribably hot in the summer and equally cold in the winter and no good for anything at all except social prestige all right so (laughs) like critique a sun porch and i don't know yeah i don't know why that one stuck with me but i i just like you know the observations are going to be sharp. Yeah, sharp, a little bit acidic, but not so much that it detracts from the story. Yeah, and they feel true as, as they as they come out. Like, that was another thing, is like sometimes those retorts can feel forced, but I did feel that Millar's, a lot of them felt like, okay, I can I can see somebody saying that to somebody else. or And that's where I get that, like, vision of Miller and Millar sitting in the living room running through dialogue together and saying, no, it should sound like this. It should sound like that, you know? And even if yeah. even if that's not true, yeah. I like that image. Sure. Well, they're dead now, so we can just make up lies about them. <laughs> I read in, in Goodreads, somebody wrote that uh, they referred to this book as being melodramatic. And 
I agreed with that at, at the beginning. I was like, come on, Helen, yeah. just take a chill pill and, and, and take it down a notch. I, I don't need this exaggerated family drama. But once I got through that and started to, you know, see what this book was really about, I started to feel that that wasn't a, a valid criticism. Uh, did you ever get that feeling or, or impression about the book? Yeah, I, I would say I had a similar feeling to you where at first I was I was almost like, um, oh, no, we're going down the... Uh, What's his name? Um, Fucking John McDonald. Uh, a flash of green? No. Uh, <laughs> Night has a thousand eyes. Uh, what the fuck's that guy's name? Oh, Cornell. Yes, yeah. Cornell Woolrich. And, and they did they did talk about this book in the context of of him yeah. too. I think I was I was worried we were yeah. going down the Cornell Woolrich uh, track here, especially because oh uh, no, yeah. yeah. But we we did. Um, it recovers from that, and I think some of the drama. You know, I think it's easy to, especially in this time period, to me, it's easy for us as modern readers to, like, look at this as melodrama. Because it's a social criticism, it's like we've kind of like, okay, we're this isn't an issue for us anymore, so it sounds dr- melodramatic. But it would have been mm-hmm. more of an issue in the time. And that does lead me to one point before we leave characters kind of, like, totally behind is, is this character of Douglas. I do think, even though her, her handling of... Uh, a homosexual character is dated, I will give her credit in some of the dialogue exchanges between the mother and the son trying to explain who he is to her and like why he can't just take pills and um, and and fix it, you know, in her in the mother's words, fix it. I will give her give her some credit on on that front. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good point. Uh, and I think that that probably was uh, ahead of its time. Yeah. So, I mean, with that, and and I don't, I mean, there's definitely dated language and definitely derogatory type stuff in there, but it's, it's certainly not as bad as a lot of things of the time. And I do think it's given more emotional space and room than, than a lot of other novels. In some ways, this novel could have been put out five years ago and it could have worked except for a few dated references and, and some of the context, but it does have a little bit of Megan Abbott in it, its tautness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do see a lineage between Dorothy Hughes and, and Margaret Millar and all the way up to Megan Abbott. There, there, is a, there is a relationship happening here in these stories. And it's really refreshing to see, especially given how much we loved Abbott's work. Yeah. I did mention writer's craft already a little bit. I talked about the prose and the melodrama. Was there anything else you wanted that stood out to you about the craft? You mentioned the dialogue and the sharpness. No, I think I've covered most of what I, I really love about the craft. I think when I, when I go, going, just going back to my rating, the reason for me this is a lower rating is I'm just not as big a fan of the psychological thriller uh, as I am other subgenres of under the, the crime fiction umbrella. And that said, like, this is a really good example. And I think Millar is an author whose work, it deserves to be on these best lists. It deserves to be uh, revisited and promoted into the the canon of, of 20th century crime fiction. I would agree with that. Looking back on the people who considered Margaret Millar a touchstone or referenced her or, or valued her work, you know, she was respected by, by Truman Capote, was respected by Agatha Christie and, and Evelyn Waugh. She was not unknown back in the day. She was considered a legitimate hard-ass literary and crime writer Mm -hmm. and she's influenced so many people that that we respect i've mentioned laura Littman and megan abbott gillian flynn she's not a bit character in the story of crime fiction in american letters she was she's a central player as much if not more so i would argue than ross mcdonald i think they both we could just say they're equal but she's certainly not lesser than in terms of her impact uh, at the time though she is less regarded now, uh, not because of the power of her writing, but simply because, well, for a lot of reasons, uh, sexism probably being one. Yeah, and it's not to say that she's completely forgotten, because I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, most of her work is still in print. There's you know been many recent omnibus uh, collections of her work. There's been a resurgence in the past 20 yeah. years uh, as, as we've gone back and tried to dig into what, what really is, you know, crime and noir fiction i mean she could she could definitely be um, a little bit more into the spotlight than she she currently is i think you know this is a reoccurring thing that had she had a, a reoccurring character that was more you know filmable or or something like that then she probably 
would be better known. I, I think that's a case of in here as well, that authors, whether that be Agatha Christie or, you know, lesser known authors, having a, a reoccurring character that people feel, you know, connected to uh, does help with a legacy uh, for any potential writers out there. If you're, <laughs> you might want to consider that if you're worried about history. I mean, it's true. They should have gotten uh, Humphrey Bogart to play the role of Helen Clarvo. <laughs> and, and had they done that, we, we would still be talking about this book today. <laughs> well, well, I don't know, Justin, uh, do you want to wrap this one up or? Yeah, I think I'm good. I, I, I've said my piece and I'm, I'm happy to move on if you are. I think that sounds like an episode. Justin, what do we have to look forward to in, in our upcoming episodes? I'll give you our next two uh, for episode 65. We're going to uh, hang out with S.A. Cosby's Razorblade Tears, which won all the big awards last year and is still winning awards After we hang out with Razorblade Tears, we're going to uh, read up on our Caribbean noir, specifically some Cuban noir, and try to figure out what's happening uh, in the Caribbean and and particularly Cuba in the context of crime fiction. I'm excited about that. We found a lot of cool books to check out. I hope we have some surprises for you out there. Kurt, how do they contact us? Well, if you want to email the show uh, with specific questions, comments, or concerns, you can do so at pointblanknoir at gmail.com. If you'd like to interact with the uh, Point Blank community of listeners, the best place for that is really uh, Facebook at this point. Uh, we have a Facebook group, two pages, one for the show, one for our uh, our group. Fairly low traffic there, but you can find us at Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. As we mentioned earlier, we do have a Patreon. If you'd like to give a, a you know, even a dollar uh, a month helps with the show. And you can always give us a nice review on iTunes. We really do appreciate that. And that is, a, at least for me, a big driving uh, reason uh, to continue doing the show is seeing a nice review. With that, I guess goodbye for now. We'll see you next time when we talk about Razorblade Tears. Hope you have a good month, Kurt, and, and we'll see you all soon. Yeah, you too, Justin. Bye-bye. Point blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders.